Jungle Deep, 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 Deep. The podcast that explores the tropical lifestyle. Hello and welcome to the podcast Jungle Deep. This is your host, Dr. Jones. We are on safari and I'm here with you to learn, to have fun, and to explore the jungle. Welcome to Jungle Deep. We have some terrific guests coming in future episodes. Let me tell you about them. We will have a conversation with a young conservation activist. I call her a rock star of conservation. She is Allie Boyer, a 14-year-old who cares about wildlife and decided to do something about species extinction. Allie has raised thousands of dollars to help save orangutans. We will learn how she did it. Promise to our listeners for many, many weeks now, finally in February, we will feature our conversation with the one I call the real Tarzan of Africa, DeWitt DeToy. DeWitt lives in Africa and has been in training for Tarzan for years now. He has an amazing and inspiring story to tell. Don't miss it. You can learn more about our fascinating scheduled guest in the coming up section of our homepage at jungledeep.com. So what did happen in 2012? As a fan of Jungle Deep, you will know that we had an Earth Summit this summer, but there were several other important conferences this year, too. The IUCN Congress, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, get together about species conservation, which took place in South Korea in September. The Biodiversity Convention in India in October, producing new numbers about the great contribution of indigenous community conservation areas. The Pacific Islands Leaders Forum in August, and the dramatic increase in protected ocean areas. The United Nations Convention on Climate Change in Qatar in December. Dr. Mittermeier is back with us today with a review of some of the major environmental accomplishments of 2012. You may remember Dr. Mittermeier is a primatologist, a specialist in monkeys and apes, and president of one of the largest and oldest conservation organizations, Conservation International. You may not know that Dr. Mittermeier appeared on the cover of Time magazine, identified as one of the heroes of the planet. He has traveled to and explored most of the tropical rainforests on Earth, while at the same time participated in most of the global conferences on the environment, working with world leaders in government and business. Be sure to check out the new video I have about Dr. Mittermeier on the show notes page for this episode. It's excellent. I am most pleased to be able to bring to you this exclusive conversation with such an esteemed expert. Hello, Dr. Mittermeier. Hi, how are you? Good to talk to you again. We're so pleased to have you with us today, and we'll be covering a topic that's, well, I think it's it's very useful to kind of summarize things every so often and take a look at where we are and where we've come and so forth, and there's no one that gets around the world and studies these topics like you do and in your position and you've been doing it for so long as well. So I'm eager to hear about what you think about the year 2012, what we've been able to achieve uh, this year and and where we might be headed in the new year. Before we get started though, I'd like you if you would, especially for our younger listeners, if you could kind of give us a big picture of who the major players are in this global process of dealing with I mean, we have an environmental crisis going on around the world, and we have organizations working to make things better. Who are these people, and what are the events? What, what are they doing? 
So last year was a very, very busy year in terms of uh, in events and international conventions and meetings of various kinds dealing with conservation issues. Probably the most uh, occupied year since 1992. It was really quite amazing with a number of different uh, activities coming together. There are many, many different players. There are literally thousands of players in the uh, in the conservation business. But let me just highlight a few of the organizations and a couple of the conventions that really require attention. One of these is the Biodiversity Convention, the Convention on Biological Diversity, which deals with maintaining the full range of biodiversity species ecosystems that exist on our planet, also ensuring that there is access and benefit sharing. The countries that are poor, countries that are rich in biodiversity, need to have their rights respected. So there's an agreement now also on access and benefit sharing. So it's not just a matter of the rich countries going in, taking the biological resources of the poor countries as happened so much during the colonial period, and then benefiting from them and leaving very little behind for the countries that actually have these resources. So I'll say a little bit more about that convention because we had a very important meeting in India back in uh, October of the Biodiversity Convention. You know, the other big convention is the Climate Convention, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. That one meets every year. The most recent meeting was in December in Doha, in Qatar, in the Persian Gulf. And that one has uh, had a bit less success in terms of reaching major agreements than the biodiversity one has. So those are the two of the three conventions that deal with these issues. There's a third convention on desertification. All three of these conventions emerged from the uh, Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. Also emerging from the Earth Summit in 1992 was the Global Environment Facility, which is the principal funding mechanism supported by a range of wealthier country governments that supports both biodiversity and climate activities. In terms of the major conservation organizations, you have the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, which is based in Switzerland, Glan, Switzerland, outside of Geneva. And that organization has been in existence since 1948. Wow. It's kind of the overarching organization. It has both government and non-governmental members. I've been associated with it for more than 40 years, most recently as a, as a vice president. I just stepped down oh. as a vice president back in September. And then you have the big international conservation organizations like World Wildlife Fund, Conservation International, my organization, the Nature Conservancy, and the Wildlife Conservation Society, which used to be the uh, New York Zoological Society. They changed their name about 20 years ago. Those are the four big, what we call bingos. And there are many, many other medium to small conservation organizations in both the developed and the developing countries, and they participate to varying extents in these many different meetings. Now, these groups are referred to as NGOs often, non-governmental organizations. Is that correct? That's correct. The non-governmental organizations, these are not-for-profit organizations that focus on biodiversity conservation and other conservation activities. And uh, it's interesting that with biodiversity in particular, that much of the action, unlike other sectors, much of the action in biodiversity conservation is very much at a local level and carried out by civil society groups, NGOs. More than just about any other sector that we deal with, this is one where the role of NGOs, the role of civil society, is really enormous. So without the participation of civil society, it would be very difficult to achieve conservation objectives in this field. It's also true, though, these days to say that most of the governments have representatives at these events? Oh, absolutely. Uh, The the big conventions are principally government-driven activities, and the plenary sessions involve uh, negotiations among the different governments. But what has become increasingly interesting and increasingly important, and it's really come to the fore over the past year, is that there are the side events that take place. The NGOs organize a wide variety of different side events at these convention meetings, and very often some of the real action that takes place is through these different uh, NGO fora and workshops and seminars and symposia. And some of the real concrete results that emerge from those side events are actually often more important than what the governments decide. The government uh, negotiations always tend to be lowest common denominator, whereas uh, some really innovative stuff takes place in these side events. Oh, that's a good point. So these are basically governmental events, 
But the action's happening uh, and all the side events that are occurring at the same time involving a, a lot of NGOs from around the world. And then the third major type of player would be the business community, would it not? Yes, of course. The business community is increasingly interested in this issue. We have a very strong program dealing with the business community and have for more than 20 years now. We have a whole program called the Center for Environmental Leadership in Business, CELB, C-E-L-B. And we've been developing partnerships with a wide variety of corporations, particularly in the U.S., but really in other parts of the world as well. Because if you don't have that private sector involvement, you really, again, you're not going to succeed. It's got to be a partnership of NGOs, the private sector, governments, and then local communities, because in biodiversity conservation in particular, the, the local communities are going to be the ones who determine whether we fail or succeed over the long term, because they are the ultimate custodians of a lot of this biological wealth, national parks, protected areas, community reserves, all of these things that really will be essential for uh, long-term sustainability of the planet. Are there any corporations that stand out uh, kind of a head and shoulders above the others as far as being involved in environmental issues? Yeah, well, you'd be surprised at some of the corporations that have been. <laughs> I think we would. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Walmart has been a really good partner for us over the years. We also have a good relationship with Starbucks. We're working with uh, a wide variety of other sectors. Uh, you know, Walmart is such a big corporation that has so many suppliers and buyers that if they set best standards for their activities, then their suppliers and their buyers are kind of obliged to follow the best practices that they establish. Uh huh. And you're seeing that happening. We are. What about the oil industry? Well, the oil industry. Uh, do, do they make a? Pre do they have a presence? They do have a presence. Um, some of the mining companies have a presence as well. Um, you know, they're in the process of evolving. I think one of the most important bodies is the Consumer Products Forum, which is something like 400 companies. They deal with a wide range of different commodities that are sold in the world. And, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is to get them to adopt best practices in terms of uh, palm oil. Palm oil is a widely used product for many different things around the world. We want to make sure that as the use of palm oil increases, that we don't clear natural forests to create new palm oil plantations, but rather to place those plantations in degraded land. I and mean, this is an ongoing dialogue. Yes, we hear a lot about palm oil being the cause of a lot of rainforest destruction and, and led to believe it's continuing to this day, but there's a lot of discussion and concern about changing the way they do things. And I guess that could be said for an awful lot of corporate activities around the world. We're seeing a lot of evolution in corporations. I mean, first, another good partner for us is Disney, which has uh, given us what's probably the largest corporate grant thus far for voluntary uh, carbon emission uh, projects, uh, RED Plus, this reduction in emissions from deforestation and degradation. And they're supporting us to the tune of $7 million in uh, Eastern uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and in the Northern Peruvian Andes to save forests, protect forests as a hedge against climate change. So we're very pleased with the collaboration with Disney, which we've had for a long time as well. Well, I think this is very important input you're providing here on this topic because, you know, I think a lot of average people are, you know, they're they're afraid that, uh, you know, they think that the government isn't paying attention and doesn't care and corporations are just out to make a buck and the only people doing any work are the nonprofit organizations. And we need to get past that kind of reality and that kind of thinking about it. And it sounds like there's a lot of activity in areas where we, we'd like to know there's a lot of activity. Well, in this sector, the, you know, non-governmental organizations continue to push the agenda and, and really uh, lead it in many ways. But we're getting more and more corporate partners. And then we have governments that are um, increasingly enlightened on this sort of thing. We, you know, it's, it varies from government to government and varies from issue to issue. But overall, we're seeing uh, what I think are, are positive changes. The big disappointment this year was that we still are nowhere near a legally binding agreement on climate change. That really is a is an issue because no one really wants to step forward and take a leadership role on this. And yet we know that there's going to be serious impact. Even if we had a legally binding agreement put in place right now, we started to take the appropriate measures. I think we're still going to see very significant impacts from climate change over the next few decades and in the remainder of this century. But you know, other things have been progressing uh, reasonably well. The, the, the thing about conservation is there's no final victories. You have a never-ending battle. You have victories, and then you have setbacks, and you have to just continue to keep pushing forward and not, not become too pessimistic because of the failures and not become too overly optimistic because of the successes and just continue to 
push the agenda forward. Well, you've identified for us the major players in this thing, the governments, the NGOs, and the corporations. Now tell us about the events. Tell us a little more about these meetings you've mentioned already. Now, is it the Earth Summit? Is that like an overriding, like an umbrella event out of which everything else is happening, or is it not that simple? It's not quite that simple. Let me give you a sequence of events. And one of the things that have really emerged from this year that I think is absolutely critically important is an increasing recognition of the fact that biodiversity and ecosystem services need to be central to long-term sustainable development. If we're going to have any chance of feeding and having a healthy, sustainable planet over the next few decades and this century, we need to not see the environment as a sideshow and something that we pay attention to when convenient, but rather to see the natural world, the healthy, continued functioning of the natural world as being fundamentally important to a long-term development, human well-being, poverty alleviation, and all of that. And in two events, first event that we helped to organize, we actually organized it together with the government of Botswana, the president of Botswana, Ian Kama, is a member of our board of directors, and he's one of the most enlightened leaders in Africa, probably and anywhere in the world. And he hosted in Gaborone, the capital of Botswana, a meeting of 10 African governments, a number of corporations, including Walmart and Woolworths from South Africa, a number of others, a number of NGOs as well, where we talked about the need for natural capital accounting to become central to the way governments do their national income accounts and the way private uh, companies do their corporate accounting as well. Renewable natural capital is basically biodiversity, okay? It's the renewable natural resources that derive from a living world. Natural capital is a term that's popular now because capital and uh, is more understandable to uh, corporations than it is to businesses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to businesses. Yeah. Basically, the same sort of thing. But we got we came out of this uh, meeting in Gaborone in May of, of uh, 2012, this past year, uh, with a statement agreed upon by the 10 countries there and signed on to by a number of these corporations saying that we should incorporate a natural capital account the way these national and corporate income accounts are generated. You know, things like GDP, for example. Now, now, essentially, at its core, we're talking about assigning money value to our natural resources, determining how much they're worth in, in cash. Is that what we're talking about? That's exactly what we're talking about. Now, if you look at it, you know, the way we've done it traditionally, you look at a patch of tropical forest, you value it at zero, and then you want to you know, cut it down and turn it into an oil palm plantation, well, then the oil palm plantation looks like a good deal. But if you look at all the services that that tropical forest uh, provides, from watershed protection to carbon sequestration to biodiversity protection to ecotourism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then all of a sudden that oil palm plantation does not look like such a good deal. And that's something that we need to get better and better at recognizing and incorporating into the way we do these income accounting procedures. Now, that event in Gaborone in Botswana led to a series of side events at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in June, one of which was led by the World Bank uh, with our participation, participation of others, what they called the uh, 5050 Initiative. And they sought to get, building on what we've done with the Gaborone Declaration, getting 10 African countries, they sought to get 50 countries and 50 corporations to sign on to an agreement that they would adopt a natural capital accounting into their income accounting procedures. We wound up with, I think, 60, more than 60 countries and more than 90 corporations signing on to this. Wow. So that was very significant. To me, that was the, the most important thing to be emerging from the Earth Summit, uh, the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit in June. The next big meeting that we had was, was dealing with the IUCN Congress, the World Conservation oh, Congress of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, this, organ this umbrella organization of NGOs and governments that I've been associated with for so long. That took place in South Korea, in Jeju. And again, that reinforced a lot of the same concepts and, of course, also dealt a lot with the importance of species conservation per se, specific species conservation. It dealt with the importance of protected areas and, and a wide variety of other issues. You are listening to Jungle Deep. 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 Hello, this is Dr. Jones. I believe that the destruction of the tropical rainforest is humankind's greatest environmental problem. 
not climate change, not pollution, not nuclear waste, not food production, not a whole host of topics you could add to the list. I care about these things, and I have to admit that climate change and the depletion of the oceans have my particular attention. But I know that the destruction of the tropical rainforest is number one. Now, I would not be surprised if you told me that none of the people around you in your daily life are doing anything to help save the remaining tropical rainforest. We obviously have to change this situation. Many people do not take action on this issue because they are confused about what to do. Confusion breeds inaction. Well, I have a solution. Visit the Jungle Deep website and look in the directory at the top of the show homepage for my new article called How Can I Help Save the Rainforest? It includes my five steps to saving the rainforest. It's simple, direct, clear-cut. Oh, I, I probably shouldn't have used that expression. It's, uh, it's direct and it's simple. Anyone can follow these steps and everyone should. Get a copy into the hands of everyone around you. At the very least, it's a great conversation starter. And together, when there is enough of us taking action, we will save both humanity and the planet. Read and print out the list, Five Steps to Saving the Rainforest, from the Jungle Deep website. Go to jungledeep.com and click in the directory on How Can I Help Save the Rainforest? Hi, this is Kelly Patterson from the Velveteen Lounge Kitchen web series. I make my lime jello marshmallow cottage cheese surprise while listening to the Jungle Deep podcast. Hi, I'm Al Bowl, film producer of Tars and Lord of Louisiana Jungle, and I clean my lenses while listening to Jungle Deep. Aloha, this is Marty Lush from the Tikiaki Orchestra. And when I'm not vibing with the band, I'm listening to the vibes of Ken Jones and Jungle Deep. Jungle Deep, 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 deep. Hi, this is Dr. Jones from the Jungle Deep Podcast. The parrots are shaking the shakers, the monkeys are hitting the slapsticks, and the tiki gods are blowing the trumpets. It's party time here at Jungle Deep. Out under the towering jungle trees, Tarzan is kicking up his heels and swinging in delight in the twilight. It's time to celebrate the wonders of jungle wildlife, tiki music, Tarzan movies, exotic food, and the tropical mood at the Jungle Deep Podcast. Jungle Deep, deep, deep. Hello, this is Dr. Jones. I believe the better you get to know the jungle's wonderful creatures, the more you will care about them. And as you care about them, you'll want to join with me in efforts to protect them and save them from extinction. I want to draw your attention to the Jungle Deep website and the ways I am promoting tropical rainforest education and conservation. In addition to the awesome expert guests and regular reports from our wonderful field correspondents on the podcast, I am building a website with resources to help everyone, especially students, find helpful and motivating information. One example is the new Wildlife Theater, which will contain a collection of photos and videos of exotic animals from the jungles around the world. Top-notch zoos and other conservation groups are contributing content to the Jungle Deep Wildlife Theater. You will find the Jungle Deep website by going to www.jungledeep.com. It couldn't be easier. Check the Jungle Deep website often because it is growing every week. Jungle Deep is a -a one-of-a-kind podcast that promotes conservation in a most entertaining way. If you want me to make more Jungle Deep episodes, let me know by making a donation to this environmental education podcast. If you would like, for a donation of $20 or more, I'll be happy to make a shout-out on the show. That's a short message about your favorite wildlife or conservation organization. You may send any amount by check mailed to me, the producer, Ken Jones, at P.O. Box 61, Murphy's, M-U-R-P-H-Y-S, California, 95247. You know, most people don't make a donation and just listen to the podcast for free. That makes your donation all the more important. The core message of Jungle Deep is that we need more people to participate in conservation. It's not enough to love nature. These days, caring about the environment absolutely requires action. Your action in support of this show will be used to grow Jungle Deep and to help me reach more people with our conservation message. Thank you. Now, more of Jungle Deep. 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 And 
one of the things that really has come to the fore again this year is the critical importance of protected areas, parks and reserves, and not just little pieces of real estate that we set aside for a few rich people to visit. Increasingly, they're being seen as fundamentally important pieces of development strategies, that if we don't protect these areas, that we don't protect the natural resources, the biodiversity, these ecosystems that are in these protected areas, ultimately we're going to be shooting ourselves in the foot. And we really need to have much, much greater protected area coverage in the years to come. Right now we're at 13% terrestrial coverage in protected areas. When we had the last meeting of the Biodiversity Convention in 2010, we were under 1% in the marine realm. This year, we made some progress on terrestrial area, the protected area coverage, but we made enormous progress in marine conservation. This was another meeting that was held. This one was in August in the Cook Islands. Pacific Island Leaders Forum, in which a group of Pacific Island nations, about 20 these tiny island nations and territories that still belong to countries like France and the UK and New Zealand, these tiny areas, these tiny countries, tiny in terrestrial terms, in terms of their land areas, but enormous in terms of their marine areas, their exclusive economic zones in the oceans, they've started to make unbelievable commitments, just enormous commitments. The country of Kiribati, which is, used to be called the Gilbert Islands in the colonial period, it's tiny terrestrial. It's about 820 square kilometers, which is about 300 square miles. It's just tiny little patches of land. And yet it has, because of the way the islands stretch out over a vast area of ocean, uh, they have a, a marine area of three and a half million square kilometers, which is about 40% the size of the United States. And they just declared last year a marine protected area called the Phoenix Islands Protected Area. They actually declared it a couple of years ago. It's just starting to be implemented now. The Phoenix Islands Protected Area, that's 410,000 square kilometers. That's the size of California. Mm. Wow. Amazing. And then at this meeting, another even smaller island nation, the Cook Islands, which is about 200-something square kilometers, really tiny in land area, declared a 1.2 million square kilometer marine protected area. That's an area that is just shy of being the size of the state of Alaska in terms of marine realm. It's just unbelievable what some of these small island nations are doing. So that was a very, very big development. But I, I got to ask you, one wonders with such a small island nation claiming protected areas so large, are they in a position to monitor it, to enforce it? How is that enforced once people, you know, make such well, the, announcements? Yeah, well, the big, uh, the big issue, of course, now is that uh, once they've made this enormous commitment that we need to work closely with them to provide them with the surveillance equipment, the ability to enforce protection, to enter into international agreements where other nations that are seeking marine resources don't just rip them off. And we're in the process of helping them to do this. We, with the Phoenix Islands Protected Area, we've created a trust fund that provides them with some of the resources needed. But obviously, the creation of these areas is the first step. Once you have the area created, you draw a line on a map, and that's extremely meaningful and should not be minimized in any way because if you don't have that official declaration, you're nowhere. Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. Once you've got the official declaration, it opens the door for all sorts of other involvement and support. Right. And in fact, the Phoenix Islands protected area, this 410,000 square kilometer California sized uh, area belonging to Kiribati has already been recognized as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. So you've got a global recognition of the importance of this area, and that really opens the door to get increasing support. So we're, we're pretty optimistic that these countries are really uh, setting the bar very high, and now it's uh, incumbent on us and the richer nations to help them actually implement this and, and put the appropriate enforcement in place. It would seem that there's a very big opportunity in protected area enforcement work in the future. Oh, it's huge. We have to do two things. One is we still have to create many new protected areas if we're going to have a sustainable planet. I believe that in one form or another, we have to protect 50% of the planet at least to ensure that it's sustainable in the face of an increasing human population. We're going to add at least 2 billion more people to the human population. And if we uh, 
if we think we can survive by de continuing to degrade ecosystems and not have a stock of intact functioning systems in place at scale over the course of the next few decades, uh, we're dreaming. We're just not going to, it's just not going to happen unless we really make a major commitment to ensuring the long-term viability of the natural world. Now, the next big meeting after the IUCN Congress uh, and the Pacific Islands Leaders Forum, Pacific Islands Forum took place in August and the uh, meeting of the IUCN took place in Korea, uh, South Korea in uh, September. In October, we had Conference of the Parties of the Biodiversity Convention in Hyderabad in India. And that also produced some very good results. India made a $50 million commitment uh, itself, and other countries made a commitment to really look at their budgets and how they could increase support for biodiversity conservation activities. They didn't come up with specific numbers, which was a bit of a disappointment, but they did commit to having this be much more of a central issue for them. Again, one of the side events brought up what I think is a, a very, another very, very important development this past year, and that is the importance of indigenous and community-owned conservation areas. Now, traditionally, protected areas have been the realm of parks and reserves, have been the realm of federal governments or state governments or even municipal governments. So in this country, we have national parks and reserves, we have state parks, and sometimes we have municipal-level parks as well, and that's the case in, in a lot of other countries. But parallel to this, we've seen over the past decade a rapid increase in community-owned conservation areas developed by indigenous communities, for instance, the Indians in South America and in other parts of the Western Hemisphere, and many other kinds of indigenous and community-owned protected areas. And a lot of the action in protected area creation over the next few years is going to be in these indigenous and community-owned lands. A few organizations have done a study looking at how much was already covered by such indigenous and community-owned lands, these ICCAs, as they're called. And we were very happy to see that they may be equivalent in extent, roughly 12 or 13 percent of the land surface of the planet, may be equivalent in extent to the areas, the more traditional protected areas, parks and reserves that we have out there. So in point of fact, now, we have to really look at these numbers in detail, but I think they're real. And in point of fact, we may be already at 25% of the planet protected through either traditional protected areas or through these indigenous and community-owned conservation areas. And this is something that we've been engaged in as an organization for many years now, working with indigenous communities in South America, for instance, the Kayapo Indians in the southern Brazilian Amazon, where we've helped them to maintain their traditional lands, which are declared uh, indigenous lands in Brazil. These areas are 11 and a half million hectares, which is roughly equivalent in size to the state of Virginia. And it has only 6,000 people living in it, mm. living largely traditionally. I mean, obviously, they're, they've adopted some Western ways, but 6,000 people living in an area the size of Virginia, the rest of it is largely intact, pristine forest. So these areas can be very, very significant. And this, was a, this to me was one of the big developments of 2012 as well, the recognition of the fact that these areas are so significant and that they are actually covering a very uh, large extent of land already. Wow, that's, that's very interesting. You're saying that, if I understood you correctly, we estimate about 13% of land is protected by government-initiated activities. These include reserves, parks, and that kind of thing. Actually, 13% of the area of, of the Earth, of the land-based uh, area of the Earth, has some form of protection, of official protection. And you're saying that there's another 10 to 15% that might be protected simply by the local people on a smaller local kind of level. Is, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, these community-owned conservation areas increasingly also have official recognition by governments. I mean, this is, it's evolving. Mm -hmm. okay. It's evolving. It's not, yeah, right. every country has different laws dealing with indigenous and community-owned areas. But in point of fact, what we are seeing is that these areas, with or without official recognition, are increasingly being created. And some of them are actually very strong. Some of them, in fact, are stronger than the government-run parks or reserves. And it's very exciting. And, and the numbers, again, the numbers need still some verification, but they seem to be roughly equivalent to what we already have protected in parks and reserves of the more traditional kind. So this is really cool. And this, I think... Yeah, this is very encouraging. 
very good news. Yeah, it's very encouraging. I came out uh, of 2012 thinking that that might have been the most important development uh, along with this recognition of the need for natural capital for biodiversity to be seen as central to sustainable development and poverty alleviation. And then this huge burst of activity in the marine realm, especially in the Pacific, where you know, we were at less than 1% in 2010 when the Biodiversity Convention set a target of 10% for the marine realm by 2020. And we're getting close to 4% now, up from 1%, which doesn't seem like a lot. Or 4% of the marine realm is a very large area because the, ocean, the oceans are so enormous. So nervous. big, yes. Wow, that's, well, that's, that's very interesting and some very encouraging news. Is there anything more about the summary that you would want to share with us? Well, I think those are the main points. I hope that 2013, which has a few less meetings, uh, so we can actually focus on getting things done in the field, hopefully will be a successful year and one in which we can implement and put <laughs> into practice some of the good concepts that have emerged from 2012. And we really need to keep pushing in some of the highest priority countries in the world. I mean, I, I think you know I work a lot in Madagascar, and we've been kind of at an impasse with Madagascar over the past four years uh, since there was a coup there in March of 2009. The fitting government of Madagascar is still not recognized by any other nation on Earth, but uh, we have hopes that there is going to be a democratic election in 2013, which will enable us to perhaps go back to a more functional system at the government level. In the meantime, we continue to work with the local communities there to create more of these community-owned protected areas and to continue at least some level of conservation effort. But that one has been very frustrating. We didn't make a whole lot of progress in, in 2012 there, but we're hopeful that if we can get elections uh, to take place there in 2013, that some good things will happen. Well, that's something to keep our eyes on. What other things coming up in the new year are you uh, looking forward to? Well, I'm looking forward to spending some more time in the field. I spent a lot of time in conferences and conventions in 2012. I've got some expeditions uh, to the Amazon, perhaps one to China coming up, uh, another one to Suriname. I'm hoping to do a walk with my two sons across the southern part of Suriname along some tracks between a couple of the major Indian villages in the interior. There's something that no one other than the Indians themselves have ever done. So, well, I can still do it. i got to do this stuff while I'm still physically able. <laughs> I, don't know how much, I don't know how much longer that's going to last. <laughs> you've, you've done an awful lot. Tell us again, what's your count on the number of countries you've been uh, to in your lifetime? You've been to every rainforest in the world. Well, right now... In 57 countries, I think I've been to more rainforests now than anyone else. I'm still missing some. Uh, I've still got a few to go to. But uh, the one thing I'm sure about is that I've seen more, more primate species, monkeys, apes, lemurs, etc., than anyone else. But I've still got some interesting rainforest areas that I haven't been to yet. So that's on the agenda for the next few years as well. Now, I missed that number. What was that number again? Uh, for a number of countries? Yes. 157. Okay. <laughs> Okay. My oldest son, John, is at, I think he's at 102 now, and he's 27. And my son, Mickey, who's been on the program, um, he's in Europe right now. And I think he's going to get, with the four countries he's visiting in Europe now, he's going to get up to 70 countries, and he's 20. Yes, that's amazing. Anything else you'd like to add regarding the upcoming year? I'm looking forward to a pretty successful year, and hopefully we can move forward some of these agendas de demonstrating to the world that biodiversity conservation, natural capital, really is fundamentally important to long-term human well-being and really the core element in any efforts to develop green economies or healthy, sustainable economies or just any kind of sustainable development activities in general really depend heavily on making sure that this base of, of natural capital is maintained into the future. To wrap up this episode, I wanted to ask you, for the average citizen listening to this podcast, it sounds like a lot of things are happening and a lot of you folks at the top of these organizations are getting together and you're hammering out agreements and you're bringing new people to the table and there's a growing effort to help save our natural resources, it's to switch over to a sustainable way of managing these things. What's your advice for them? Can they relax now and let you guys handle it? Or is there still a role for the average citizen to play in all of this? Oh, you never can relax because there are so many challenges out there. And there's absolutely an enormous need for the average citizen to participate, to become more involved, to adopt appropriate practices of their daily lives, you know, recycling, reduction of resource consumption, all of these things that we always hear about. 
These are essential. So there, there needs to be much greater involvement. Support local and national and international organizations that are doing this work in whatever way you can. But also, I keep telling people that they need to get out and see these natural areas firsthand. So much of what we're doing these days is sitting on computers and looking at the internet and, and really living vicariously by, through video games and television programs and movies and everything else. But what I always tell young people and middle-aged and older people as well is that it's so easy now to get out and see natural areas, either in our country here in the U.S. or to visit other parts of the world. It's much more accessible now than it's ever been. And once you've gone out to see a place in you know, Costa Rica, Madagascar, Brazil, China, wherever, you come back really having a, a feel for what it is that's important in the world and what we're trying to accomplish. So get out there and see it and do it and become a bird watcher, become a primate watcher, become a plant collector, whatever, whatever it is that tickles your fancy. But don't just sit in front of the TV set and the computer. Get out there and see what's going on in the world because it's so exciting and so much more interesting than, than living through uh, uh, the electronic media. Nothing can substitute for real live experience. Great. Yeah, you should come down in the field with us. Come with us to Suriname. See it first time. <laughs> Thank you very much. This has been terrific. Thank you. Bye-bye. All righty. Bye-bye. The music in this podcast has been, in the intro, Jericonda Mix by Ken Jones with Apple Music Loops, and the segment in our episode closing is by Don Tiki called Jungle Julie. Environmental education, wildlife preservation, tropical rainforest conservation, all wrapped up in fun, juicy, delicious American jungle culture of the past and present. Be sure to share Jungle Deep Podcast with your friends and co-workers. The show is my creation and at my personal expense. It is not currently subsidized by any business or organization, but I am ready to change that, so contact me if you would like to reach our audience with your advertising message. Audience growth is especially important for Jungle Deep to succeed and prosper, so share the show. You can see beautiful photos and learn more about Jungle Deep at our website, jungledeep.com. You gotta check it out. Where else can you go for this kind of fun? Our show notes pages have valuable links for you. I invite you to email me at ken at jungledeep.com or follow me on Twitter. Search for Jungle Deep or Ken Jones 56 all one word. I would love to hear your ideas for the show. Well, the show's over for today, so it's time to refill my Mai Tai, mount my elephant, and head back into the jungle. Thank you.